Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Perspective with me, Julie Ali. And also, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, shukr alhamdulillah. Welcome to the 10 final days of Ramadan. In the days in which is that amazing night, that night of power, which is better than a thousand months. Alhamdulillah. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us in good health to celebrate this Mubarak month of Ramadan with our loved ones in peace, in mercy, in kindness, in respect, and may we have many, many, many more Ramadans in the future. We're going to focus on the final 10 days of Ramadan and how we um, get our children involved in the spirituality of these final 10 days. And to talk us through all of that is an amazing young woman. Her name is Fazila Chiwele. She's an early childhood uh, development specialist. She's had an amazing life up to now, and we're going to ask her to share some of that with us before we start talking about the little darlings in our lives and the Mubarak month of Ramadan. And of course, we do know when we talk about the final days of Ramadan, the 10 days, we are also in preparation for the day of Eid. And of course, lots and lots and lots of excitement by our children preparing for that day of family, friends, relatives, love, mercy, and kindness. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum to you, dear Sister Fazila Chiwele. Welcome to the program. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi, Sister Jilly. Alhamdulillah, I'm really grateful to be a part of the show and I'm really honored to be once again welcomed to be on the screens advising parents, teachers about how to make a difference in the minds and lives of the little ones. Alhamdulillah. Subhanallah. I indicated that uh, you uh, travel uh, widely and uh, in our dealings pre uh, in, in preparation of the show, uh, you did tell me that you were in Saudi Arabia, you were making your way home. In fact, you just landed here a few days ago. Um, you had a very exciting time, two stints of being an au pair uh, for particular families in the kingdom. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, alhamdulillah, it is indeed a, a privilege to be um, working in a country like Saudi Arabia, alhamdulillah. That is actually every Muslim's dream to be in the country itself. So within my profession, I have been working in Saudi since 2014. That's when my journey started. I started off working for the um, Bin Khalid family and I was their au pair for the little ones. And then I moved on to the Faisal family, which also was based in Jeddah. And I was also an au pair, a child minder, and also a teacher for their little ones. And now this is my new journey, and now this is the Abdulaziz family. So these are all um, royal families, and within my um, job, I kind of teach and take care of the little ones, um, help with their secular education, help as well with their upbringing in an Islamic way. And indeed, it has been a great experience to actually be involved in, in the lives of, you know, of these little princesses and prince and getting them to, to understand how the world is Islamically and as well as um, prepare them for, you know, for um, the society that we are currently facing, be it Islamically and also non-Islamically. So it is quite a great, you know, a, a great experience and also traveling to Europe as well with them and some other countries as well. It's quite very, very interesting. And Alhamdulillah, I just got back, yes, you're right, I just got back on, on Thursday for a short stay because I'm currently having some um, health issues that I need to take care of. But inshallah, as soon as I'm um, okay, I'll be returning back, inshallah, after Ramadan, inshallah. Allah, Allah grant you Shifa, inshallah, so that you can continue your amazing work. How different, um, how different or challenging 
is the scenario in Saudi Arabia as compared with South Africa? Because you have been involved in ECD practice here in South Africa as well. The most challenging is the whole lifestyle. Remember in South Africa, we are an open and diverse society and um, you know, uh, we get to be inclined with uh, diverse cultures. But when you get to Saudi, it becomes strictly Islamically, which one might fight, which one might find it a bit um, difficult, and the strict and uh, you know the boundaries and the major, major, major transformation when it comes to your life, especially uh, because this is a royal family. It's not only ordinary family, so they have particular ways of doing things, and they have. Uh, also a particular way of how you take care of the kids as well. So that becomes very challenging if you come from a diverse country where you can do, you know, things, you know, in, um, in you know, in uh, consideration of, you know, okay, I'm teaching this culture to, there it's only Islam and that's it. You cannot teach them anything else either than Islam. And then also you find it very challenging that although it's an Islamic country, they do not have or have full understanding of what um, uh, you know Islam is because they're little ones. So they do require you to also have good knowledge in how you're going to uh, teach them. Say maybe um, the sunnahs of eating, the sunnahs of, of you know uh, talking, the sunnahs of using the bathroom. So all of these, I think that. You as a, as an au pair or, or as a a teacher, you have to be equipped with, because you're not gonna go there and be like, okay, they are from Saudi and they Muslim, so they know everything. No, you also have to have a very well understanding and knowledge of how you're going to teach and implement uh, these kind of um, very important ethics to the little ones. So I presume yeah. that you speak Arabic. Obviously, you need to speak the Arabic to be engaging with the little ones. And during your time, your stints with these families in Saudi Arabia, teaching their children as an ECD specialist, there's been a lot of learning and growing for you as well. Um, talk to us about that. Uh, how it's exactly. changed you, how it's changed you and enhanced you exactly. as a human being in these interactions? Uh, Sister Julie, you know, when you um, when you travel, it's a different experience on its own. It doesn't matter which country you go to, so it's a different experience. So in South Africa, when you go to Saudi, one thing they they look at is English. So they need you to be somebody who can speak English fluently. So it becomes an exchange of language when it comes to working with children. Because remember, these kids do not know English as fluent as, you know, as I do. And I don't know Arabic as fluent as they do. So we exchange. So I teach them in English and they will tell me in Arabic. You know, so it becomes like we're changing. And with kids, it becomes so easy for one to learn anything. Because remember, they are doing it honestly. If you tell them, do you want water? They'll be like, moya. So you understand, oh, water means moya. Okay, then you grab the vocab in Arabic and they grab the vocab in English. So indeed, it has been quite very fun for me to learn my Arabic grammar very very confidently and very comfortably because nobody pushed me. I'm, I'm getting these from the little ones as much as they're getting that from me as well. And of course, um, you do have to have an understanding of Arabic since they are, you know, brought up in an Arabic country. So for you to be able to also get your way and get, you know, your life easy, knowing Arabic is, you know, is a very um, important thing. But of course, it is not expected that when you leave South Africa, you should have Arabic as, as a language. No, it, it's just that something you will just have to adjust when you get to the royal side, to the Saudi side. But uh, for me, it has been you know, a great transformation, learning, and also experiencing this royalty that they have and 
that they live in, it's quite different. And this, you know, their whole lifestyle, their whole country, remember, I'm, I'm coming from a democratic country and I'm in the kingdom. So it's quite a very huge transformation. You know, there's no, everything goes in order according to what the king says, what the king and what the royal, what the prince says. Unlike here in South Africa, where we're just free to do, you know, whatever we want and we celebrate each other. Yeah, so it's quite an experience. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And I have no doubt that you would encourage other South Africans to take up an opportunity such as yours if it is presented to them, because it sounds like a huge learning experience. Having said that, have you spent um, previous Ramadans in Saudi Arabia living there? How different is it to Ramadan in South Africa? That's actually mind-blowing, Sister Julia, because um, in Saudi, Ramadan is, is celebrated by the whole country, by everyone. So it's like, um, it's like a, a lifestyle for them. And in, and in South Africa, Ramadan is celebrated by Muslims in particular. So I've celebrated a lot, uh, I mean, uh, quite a few Ramadan, of, you know, in, in Saudi. And what um, makes a difference is in Saudi, the days, you know, transform. So unlike here in South Africa, where a normal day starts from six o'clock, you wake up, you go to work and ends, you know. So you go to the work, you come back, and at work you get all these, you know, uh, tempting situations where people would have their lunch and whatsoever. So you have the whole day to have the Sabbath of, you know, uh, holding and keeping your fast. In Saudi, it's different. In Saudi, the night time becomes the work time. So during the day, it means they are not working. They are not going to school. They are not involved in any social and, and uh, do you understand? And then Absolutely. after Maghrib, then that's the time the shops will be open, banks will be open, whatever you have to do. Um, you know, the social movement and everything gets, you know, the city gets buzzing in the night, right until further time. Okay. So you see the, Let's the difference. Go. Or a for interrupting you there. We need to go for our first ad break. When we come back, we're going to be talking to you about uh, the last 10 days of Ramadan and the night of power, Laylatul Qadr. <laughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome back to Perspective and to the final 10 days of Ramadan, the 10 days in which we make so much of Ibadah because we're hoping to gain the blessings and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of the night of Laylatul Qadr, the night which is greater than a thousand months. We are talking with Fazila Chiwele. She is an ECD specialist and she's going to talk to us about the meaning of Laylatul Qadr and how we then uh, communicate it to the little darlings in our life for them to understand just how special, how meaningful and full of spirituality the night of Qadr is in fact. Fazila, welcome back to you. Um, and you do want to share, of course, this, this, this special 10 nights of Ramadan. We don't actually know which night it is. We are told it could be one of the odd nights in the night of Ramadan. As an ECD specialist, how do you get this concept across children for them to understand just how very special the month of Ramadan is, and then very especially the final 10 days, and more importantly, the night of Laylatul Qadr. And you find that it would be the same in Saudi Arabia as well, that the same emphasis is placed on the month of Ramadan, on the final 10 nights of Ramadan, and Laylatul Qadr. Beautiful question, Sister Julie. Uh, you know, 
uh, as a specialist in ECD, I would really, uh, really like to talk about the importance of making sure that children understand that Islam is a lifestyle. And Ramadan is a month that all Muslims look up to. We look up, you know, with excitement and we look up with so much joy and enthusiasm for this month. So we need to have that kind of spirit in our homes and as parents as well. You know, when this month comes, we need to make sure that we involve our children, firstly, in understanding what Ramadan is, uh, through you know through teaching them of course we need to make sure that we they understand the whole um, concept of what Ramadan is and also through that we need to make sure that they prepare themselves as well we engage them in preparing uh, for, for this beautiful month of course one may ask how do we prepare them of course um, if you are a family that lives you know with Islam and practicing Islam in, in the household, it becomes more easier because you can engage now in making sure that, okay, Ramadan is coming and maybe we need to get the house clean, we need to do everything together. Now you get your little ones to prepare if there's something that they would like to, you know, uh, put up for Ramadan, decorate the house, make sure they get that feeling, that vibe that Ramadan is coming. In that way, it creates the excitement, it creates the love. And through that, make sure that you also put a lot of emphasis in um, working together as a family, that this month is a month for us to be, you know, together. So mommy must be there, daddy must be there, sister, brother, helping each other. So children, you know, they feel that love. Because one thing about children they love sharing, they love doing things together. And if we practice that in our homes, it becomes very easy for them to understand. And uh, you'll find that in other uh, um, households, uh, they don't actually look at it in that way. They just, okay, Ramadan is coming, and they uh, mainly focus on the maybe the ingredients, the, the kitchen, the, the you know, whatever dishes they want to prepare. But that is... You know, another side, but if you get the child involved in a way where they feel, wow, I'm part of this, I did that, I hang up, you know, that that beautiful, uh, whatever you put in your in your dining room, whatever in your prayer, your prayer mats are new, you can go out, shop for new prayer mats if you need for the house, make them excited. That's the first and most important thing, where kids feel that they have contributed and they are part of this, you know, of whatever is happening in the household. They get to have that love for whatever is going to happen. And number two is making sure that um, when the uh, the month comes, it becomes also a lifestyle. So you take the child with you uh, to the mosque if you're going to the mosque. You make the child involved. If the child has passion for cooking or have special recipes they want to prepare, you make sure, okay, let's do this together. So now you you also getting the child to be involved spiritually because if they go to the mosque, they know, okay, we have to pray. We have to, you know, we have to serve the poor and needy if you, if you are a family that normally provides iftar for other people. You make sure the child is also there. And also time for Quran, you engage your little ones in teaching them those small surahs, sit together as a family, get involved in reading the Quran, and make sure when you read the Quran, it's not just an Arabic context. You make sure that they also understand it in their own language, in their own vernacular, so they recite it from the heart with understanding. Of course, you have to be a bit mind, um, mindful when it comes to the age. You know, the little ones would be excited just to say, La ilaha illallah, even if they don't know the meaning. But the older ones, maybe from six, seven, eight upwards, they need to now start looking and reading at the Quran in a way that they memorize it and understand it. I think the uh, most often questions asked by children is, why do we have to fast? And if we don't, explain the concept to them in a meaningful way um, with an underlying tone of spirituality, they may just look upon it as um, almost being a punitive action. I also asked you a little earlier on about 
um, Ramadan with children in Saudi Arabia. So can you respond to those two questions, please? Okay. Um, I like it when you just um, said how they might look at it if they don't understand the importance of it. So remember, when you explain or when you teach the child, especially when they're now at the age where they can understand, they need to know that Islam has five pillars and five and, and, it's, and um, fasting is one of them. So when you explain to, the, to, to them about the pillars of Islam, you can explain it in a form where they will understand. If it takes for you to actually build up a structure and say, maybe, okay, we're going to build up a house and this house has five, five pillars. So if you have the fasting as one pillar, make sure that if the, the child can actually see that if the fasting or maybe the salah or whatever is not there, the structure is not balanced. Because remember, if we just teach them out of uh, only um, theoretical, they don't actually have an understanding. So everything we do with, with kids has to be in the sense that they understand. So in Saudi, that's what I used to do. And that's how I used to do everything I do. I would put the pillars and say, this is the first thing pillar. We're going to build like our house and this is our iman. And they would actually understand, oh, if I don't do this, then my iman is not strong or my iman is over. Oh, Islam is not complete. So they get to understand the importance of fasting in this uh, context. And of course, um, with the fasting as well, you get to go more detail. How you have to be very mindful of the age. Um, I've worked with different ages, so it differs according to the age. So for a, say for a 10 year old or a nine year old, they need to understand the importance of now fasting and how important it is to actually engage and how rewarding it is you know because sometimes we just focus on you have to fast and fast and fast but we don't actually focus on after and the rewards that come after this beautiful act of worship so and kids love rewards so whatever you do with them you need to tell them do this for this reward and i always emphasize that the reward should not be only for this world and maybe making them, okay, if you fast, I'll give you, uh, you'll get this. We need to build the spiritual reward that they feel that, you know, um, Allah will reward them abundantly more than what we can give them. So in that context, we need to make sure that we actually emphasize the rewards that one gets through fasting. Alhamdulillah. Let's go for our second ad break. When we come back, we, we do need to focus on Laylatul Qadr and a whole lot more questions for you, Sister Fazila Chiwele. Um, I am enjoying the discussion and there's so much more to unpack, so please stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back. This is Perspective. Our guest is Fazila Chiwele. We're talking about Ramadan and our children and how to instill a sense of spirituality during the month of Ramadan. It is the final 10 days of Ramadan. We will touch on Laylatul Qadr in a minute or two. Welcome back, Fazila. And I'm beginning to wonder what role does storytelling, which I believe is very important, arts and crafts and uh, graphics, etc., play a role in really creating excitement in the children regarding the month of Ramadan so that they look forward to it and understand not only uh, the specialness of this month, but the spiritual significance of the month of Ramadan. This is my favorite. This is my favorite part of my job because. This is the part where we call it um, arts and arts and creativity and innovation. And this is what children love the most because children learn a lot through play. And this is where actually the most learning and understanding takes place through your arts and crafts, through your storytelling. And this 
is very important because they do not just learn uh, maybe about um, whatever the concept is, but they also improve their vocabulary through storytelling because remember there's stories, there's words they pick up. So it is very important. And this, it promotes, you know, um, uh, what do you call it? Like a psychological positiveness for the child because sometimes books don't always come with, um, you know, your lines or your stories. It can be a picture book. So it's a book, but it's a picture book. So when the child looks at it, they can actually look at it and, you know, as we say, a picture tells a thousand words. So they have this own, and they get to understand and look at the picture and have their own understanding on what the um, the picture explains. So you as a parent of this, or as a teacher, you also help in, you know, in playing along and, and making the child understand. So... Storytelling is very important, and it, this is, you know, my main, um, what can I say, my main um, line for all parents. Like, let's get our kids to be bookworms, because social media is everywhere, and with social media, nothing happens. Let's get books, let's get, you know, our kids to love, have a passion of books. And alhamdulillah, as most of us, we do have our bookstores where we can actually purchase um, good books, Islamic books, where we can read for our children. The thing is, we need to be very uh, consistent when it comes to reading. If it's storytelling, if you're going to be uh, engaged in storytelling before the child sleeps, then it needs to be consistent. Or if it's going to be in more at morning, um, morning ring, it has to be consistent. Because sometimes we cannot just read any time, you know, because the child needs to be in a comfortable place, sit down, be relaxed, you know, so that they can understand. Now, this is what parents, they do not know. You know, you cannot just pick up because, okay, let's read. It needs to be organized. And then when it comes to arts and and um, making up things, very creative. And I did speak about uh, getting the kids involved. So in that, we can have, you know, the arts, you know, maybe your mood and your star or your Ramadan. So that brings the excitement because this is, you know, a chance that kids get to become who they are through arts. They choose what colors they love. They choose what decorations they love. So through that, it's another thing. They are learning through play. And you can supervise them. Maybe say, okay, let's put some sparkly. Let's put this green. Let's put this gold. But all in all, they are enjoying this. And of course, making a mess for the little one is always a favorite part of the day. So they actually enjoy art as well. And when it comes to some plays or whatever uh, physical that they have to do, physical activity they have to do, they also like it because this can now include your, you know, be your practices or teachings on how to perform your wudu, your salah. So it becomes fun for them. So you start teaching them, okay, you're going to do, this is how we do, you know, your, your wudu, this is how you do, um, yeah, this is how you perform salah. So all of these are the best tools to actually get kids to grow spiritually, understand Islam, and have a sense of learning and growing and becoming themselves and understanding it in their own perspective as well. Subhanallah. Um, when we talk about children and when we start introducing them to start fasting in the month of Ramadan, um, that must be pretty challenging, and I'm sure you've helped a lot of little children get over the hurdle of fasting. Do you use the concept of um, now you know, even if you're doing a half a day fast, explain to the children the reason why we fast, and one of the very big um, lessons that they need to learn from there is to learn empathy for people that are less fortunate than, them, than themselves. So they'll also understand that going forward and as they grow up, they'll be more charitable and they understand what it feels like going without food and water for perhaps a whole day or a half a day. I guess that's a great concept in teaching children empathy and understanding the reason for fasting and the spirituality built around rosas and Ramadan. This is, this is also a very lovely one. It's a very lovely and tough one because 
it's very challenging. It's very challenging for for one to actually introduce this because, like you said, you need to have, you know, this kind of valuable valuable way of making sure they understand the importance of fasting. Because from my experience, children, they, they know and understand something, but they would have the curiosity. They're so curious that if I don't do it, what's going to happen? So, of course, the first thing is to make sure that they understand understand it in a way that they have, like I've mentioned before, they have this love and fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not fear of whatever they might get, of not getting whatever you promised them or whatever. So what I can advise or, or normally that I do with uh, my, my little ones is, of course, introduce, according to their age, like a half a day fast. And through this, I give them a, f- a full understanding that, okay, this is how we're going to do it. You're going to fast from morning. You'll have your soul um, with uh, maybe family and then maybe you pray your fajr and then we start the fast. And then after that, maybe oh, you can now uh, have. But I would mainly make sure that the child understands why he or she is fasting. And also emphasize that I know that Shaitan will come and whisper because this is normally what happens. They want, you know, to use their curiosity as um, as an excuse that no, I felt like this. So if you put it in a way that you as a parent, you know how curious it is when you're like fasting and you see this nice candy, but you put it in a way that Shaitan will come and whisper to you. But remember what Allah said: if you listen to Allah, this is a reward. So you make sure that you close all the gaps and corners that you know they might, you know, try to use to get away with whatever can happen with uh, within that short period of fasting. And then uh, whatever reward, say if you promise them a reward, okay, if you fast now, say for a six-year-old or a seven, who's still trying, you can have like a sticker chart where you're going to say, okay, we're going to put a star sticker, whatever. Make sure it's also consistent because kids love consistency. They love. So if you also have a reward chart, it's okay. If you did it and... Um, you you uh, you you manage to do it uh, completely. And you stick a chart because remember the big reward will come, of course, after Ramadan. So normally it can be something that can encourage the child to carry on and carry on for the you know for the whole thirty days and so forth. Alhamdulillah. Uh, can parents and should parents be involved with school environments as well to create uh, excitement and to instill the sense of spirituality uh, together with schools and teachers to make this month and let them understand and they too then can share with the children of just how important uh, and spiritual the month of Ramadan is. And especially in South Africa, um, Islamic schools aside, I'm sure we can play a role in the secular schools and they can try and assist us in making this month special. And it's also, I'm sure you'll agree with me, an opportunity for us as Muslims to teach non-Muslim people in the secular schools what Islam and Ramadan is all about. And I'm sure you have a response to that, but let's take that right after our next ad break, and then, inshallah, we will be into the final segment of our show this morning. Welcome back. This is Perspective. We're into the final segment with my dear guest, and that, of course, is Fazila Chiwele. Welcome back, Fazila. And, of course, I'm sure you'll agree this is an ideal month for us as adults as well uh, to make da'wah and to explain to our Muslim, non-Muslim friends, neighbours and people in our workplaces the significance and the importance of the month of Ramadan but very especially with the children and in the schoolroom environment? That's a lovely question, uh, Sister Julie. And yes, parents should definitely 
be role models where kids can actually see. So participation of parents is very important, be it in the school, be it in the communities, because children feel, you know, and they understand it more when they see you doing something instead of just telling them something. So I strongly um, say yes, parents should make sure that if the child goes to, a, you know, um, an Islamic school or whatsoever, try to, you know, arrange, okay, particularly, let's say, in Islamic school first, particularly, uh, let's try to arrange um, some um, gatherings, some nice celebrations, or maybe your ifbar settings or whatsoever, where children can actually feel that loveness and closeness and actually see their parents celebrating with other parents as well. And when it comes to um, non, uh, maybe like you said, the circular schools, I would really advise parents to actually um, try to see, uh, uh, which is very important to know the friends of your child, uh, you know, the friends of your child, or maybe the, the parents, whatever, or you can actually invite them to your home, maybe for iftar or for the eating or whatsoever, where the children can actually feel that, you know, um, they have a role in, in da'wah, in teaching others, you know, about this beautiful religion of ours. Or maybe you can get the child to have to make some special um, uh, recipes where maybe he or she can take to school and let others, you know, share. Because one thing about um, South Africa, when it comes to uh, our kind of ingredients and kind of, um, you know, the, the desserts or whatever we prepare for Ramadan, everybody likes it. Everybody likes it. So when the child has that kind of, you know, passion of cooking, let them make something where they can actually take to school and share with others. Okay, this is what we had. Do you want to try? In that way, it brings, you know, and it gives the child the confidence to say, wow, you know, uh, my religion is a beautiful religion. People enjoy the kind of food that we eat. And also when it comes to also making like an awareness and making the celebration understood in diverse, it's very important that we become also uh, informed in our communities, inv invite your, your fellow neighbor, even if they're not Muslim, invite them to come and have, um, you know, um, your iftar, or if it's eat, you have, you know, the important thing is when we do these things, we need to actually have, you know, prepared so that it does not become like we're inviting them over just for food or whatsoever. So we can actually have the child just to memorize maybe a short speech of which way he or she can share just before the, the table is set to make sure that the non-Muslims understand why we fast, what is Ramadan? Maybe even if they ask about, okay, what is, you know, like the date, you explain, okay, what is this? Some people would ask, what is this? They've never seen it before. That we have, you know, the good and very relevant information about the food that we have we would prepared. So this all in all makes makes it easier for a non-Muslim to understand Islam, to have the love of Islam, and also the way that we dress up, the way that we prepare ourselves for the suhoor or for whatever it's going to be in, let it be in a way that they love, you know, they love, they love it when they look at us. Because in many occasions I've actually conducted, you know, dawah through how I invite people also in my home and also with the kids as well that I've worked with in, uh, in South Africa. We will make a, you know, a celebration at schools because I've also been in South African schools where we, do, you know, good celebrations for, for, for the Muslims. And you find the other ones that, okay, I like this, this looks nice. And like you said, dawah is, you know, is, we should live it. We should not just preach it. It should be something that we also teach it and live it so that people can actually understand this beautiful religion of ours. Amen. Alhamdulillah. Okay, so let's now talk about uh, Laylatul Qadr. Um, and of course, I know it is going to be age appropriate. How do we express the importance, the might and the power of the night of power to our children, six years <coughs> onwards, for example? Um, this is also one of the best part and the sad part. Because 
when you start off, you know, when you introduce the whole concept of Ramadan, for kids, remember, they see, so they need to see something. So say you have your chart there with the number of days, 30 days, and then you have a section of 10 days. This is the days of forgiveness. This is the days of mercy. And this is, you know, the last day. So every day the child understands one day, one day gone, one day gone, one day. So on the last 10 days, now we start like a new concept. So each 10 days has like a concept. So I'm going to focus more on the last 10 days. So in the last 10 days, we make it like a, um, a uh, the 10 days where we are, you know, uh, wishing like something that like, oh, is leaving. So we are bidding farewell to this beautiful time we had, um, especially the, like the, the Ramadan stuff. And make sure the child understands, you know, that, okay, it's only for 30 days. Now on these months, remember, we don't know exact which on which night is related to father. So we can have it like um, uh, some kind of uh, an exercise that we need to do more thicker on, you know, these 10 days, not focusing on this day, this day, because we don't know. So on this day, you kind of stress that, okay, we have this beautiful treasure, because in, in, in their minds, they, they normally have their own understanding, mindful, of course, of the age, so we want Allah's mercy to, you know, to find us making dua. Make, so in these 10 nights should be the nights where you now try very hard to emphasize that the child should now start maybe before going to bed, memorizing Quran, dua, or whatsoever. And also when it's time for suhoor, just before that, you can wake the child up. Of course, it's mindful of the age. Tell the child that to make dua. So these 10 days, the child becomes very excited because they have this feeling that, oh, one of these 10 days, you know, it's a night of mercy and a night of decree. So they look forward for this um, beautiful, and in their mind, it's like a treasure hunt. They're looking for, for, for something that they don't know. So it becomes more fun. And of course, a sense of um, uh, feeling that you are up, please, uh, you know, keep us until the next Ramadan. And they also have this longing and they cannot wait, you know, when somebody leaves, when this exciting uh, visitor came to visit the house, and they have this feeling that, Ya Rab, please, whatever we did on this month, accept it with love, mercy, and may we please, you know, they look forward for another Ramadan because you made it so fun for them and you made it so easy for them to understand and celebrate this beautiful month. Sure. And finally, the day of Eid arrives. What have we done to prepare the kids for the day of Eid and uh, the actual day, the celebration of Eid? How is it going to be different from the entire month of Ramadan? And what is the most important message we instill in them for the day of Eid? Lovely day. This is now the best day. I remember I remember it when I was young. <laughs> it's just like a day of celebration. You know, uh, and for kids, it's so funny that they feel happy. They feel more than happy as if they've fasted the whole day. <laughs> they feel excited. So what I'm going to really um, emphasize is making sure that this day, family, friends come together. That is one thing kids love. Oh, my auntie is coming. My cousin is coming. My sister is coming. This is one thing that makes any child, you know, my mom is coming. My dad is coming because some kids don't live with their parents as well. If your child is in another province, get the child, bring them home. So that's the first thing, coming together. That's one thing. Sorry. And then the gifts, you know, the, the, you can exchange some gifts, some lovely gifts. Okay, I've got you this. This is also another thing where the kids feel actually very excited. Wow, I got this for, for the, you know, for, for, for my uncle. I got this for my aunt. Then another important thing is, you know, giving. Now, on this day, we also learn and teach the kids that we should also give. 
share with others. You can actually take the, take some time out with the family, go out to some you know needy uh, people, share with them, you know, share with them whatever you have. If it's maybe giving them some money, give them some money, some food, some candy. So the child looks forward to helping other people as well. And of course, the food. The food, it, it should be something they look for. And again, if the child is a passionate cook, loves making dishes, get the child involved in cooking, you know, let them experience and love whatever they have to do you know, in the kitchen and feel that they participated and contributed. And be excited for whatever meals they made, share with their friends as well. So this day should be a day where children feel happy. It's, I suppose, you know, and in Fazila, it's all about family. We need to emphasize the importance of love, friendship, forgiveness and celebration with family. And unfortunately, that's where we're going to have to leave it. Our time is up, but it's been wonderful talking with you. Allah grant your Mubarak rest of Ramadan and also Shifa uh, so that you can get better real soon and go back to your work in Saudi Arabia. Thank you once again for being with us on the show. Assalamu alaikum to you and keep us in your du'as. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm very really honored and thank you to the viewers. Thank you so much. And that's where we wrap up. Thank you indeed to our production team, to um, all of us here at uh, uh, Hilal TV. We do hope that you're going to have a wonderful, wonderful re remainder of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from you and may you be showered with the mercy and blessings of Laylatul Qadr. Till the next time, Assalamu alaikum and khuda face from me, Julie Ali.